Amen. Amen. Good morning once again. Go ahead and take your seats. Middle schoolers, you are dismissed at this time. So any middle schoolers in the room with us today and make your way to the back of this room and your teacher is waiting there to meet you and lead you to class. Love having you guys in here with us for worship. And then every Sunday after worship, we dismiss your class. So you can make your way over there. For those of you staying in the room with us today, please open with me in your Bibles to the letter of 1 Peter. So 1 Peter, it's in your New Testament, kind of towards the back near Revelation. Here's uh, how you can find it if you're flipping around. You can go find Hebrews. It's like one of the bigger books in the New Testament. Hebrews, and then go two books to the right. So you're going Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. And we're currently in a series where we're studying through 1 and 2 Peter. It's called Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, this is our fourth study in this series. It's been really good. At least I've been enjoying it so far. I hope that you've been getting a lot out of it as well. We're going to continue this morning in chapter 2. And I'll begin by reading our text, which comes from chapter 2, verses 13 through 25. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, you, if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word, and as we come to it this morning, we come just with humble hearts, Lord, ready to receive, asking you to speak to us, and asking you to help us to hear it, and receive it, and apply it in our lives. Lord, give us the grace and the strength to be able to take these things, comprehend them, and put them into practice. Lord, for our benefit and for your glory, for the sake of the mission you've called us to, we ask you to do these things as we study your word this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, let me ask you a question. What does it mean to be free? What does it mean to be free? Now, I think we would all tend to agree that freedom is a good thing. Freedom is something that we want. We want it for ourselves. We want it for other people. We think of freedom as a virtue. You're not going to meet anybody out there who thinks that freedom is bad, right? It's something that we should get rid of or do away with. Now, we all think that freedom is something good, but How do we define freedom? Well, I I looked at a lot of dictionary definitions of freedom, and basically what it boils down to is this. Freedom is the ability to do what you want to do. So freedom is the ability to do what you want to do. A while back, I was talking with a friend of mine. We grew up together, and uh, we get together still for coffee, and, you know, we're still close friends after all these years, uh, and we talk. And he knows that I'm a pastor, and I know that he's not a Christian. And we got together, and we were having coffee one day, and he told me as we were talking, you know, he said, you know, the reason I could never become a Christian is because I like being free. I like to be free. He said, I don't want to be controlled by anyone or anything. I want to be free. And that's what freedom is, right? He says, I I want to be able to do whatever I want, whenever I want, and that's freedom, isn't it? Right. So, but here's what's interesting. The Bible tells us this. The Bible says it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. It's for freedom that Christ has set you free. And yet the Bible also says that what it means to be a Christian is to surrender your life, to surrender your life to God, surrender your will over to God. So how does that work, right? If if being a Christian involves declaring that Jesus is Lord over your life, which means that you are no longer Lord over your own life, then which is it? Is Christianity about being free? Or is Christianity about surrendering your life and giving up your life over to God and doing what he wants you to do? And what about people like my friend who don't follow Jesus? Is he more free than I am? 
Is that person truly free? Are they more of a free person than a person who has surrendered their life to God? And what does it mean to be truly free? These are some of the questions that Peter is going to address and answer for us here in the second half of 1 Peter chapter 2 as we look at it this morning. Here's what's interesting. In verse 16, he says kind of the verse that sums all this section up. It's this incredible phrase. Check it out. He says, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. So be free and live as servants of God. The title of today's message is How to Live as Free People. How to Live as Free People. And there are four things that Peter points out to us here in this section. Four things that Peter points out. Here's what they are. The problem, the posture, the promises, and the pattern. So the problem, the posture, the promises, and the pattern. You can write those down if you're a note taker, but they'll also be up here on the screen. But that's how we're going to walk through this passage. Okay, the first thing we see is the problem. The problem. So in order to really understand, fully understand the problem that Peter is addressing, you need a little bit of context, a little bit of historical context for what's going on and, and what this letter was written into. So Peter wrote this letter at a time when Christians were being heavily persecuted in the Roman Empire. This letter was written in 64 AD, which was a really big year. A lot of things happened in 64 AD, right? So this is some 30 years or so after Jesus died and resurrected and ascended into heaven. And what happened in 64 AD was a couple things, but the most significant that kind of set off a chain of events was that there was a great fire in the city of Rome in 64 AD. And this fire uh, wiped out much of the city, burned a lot of it down. It also killed a lot of people there in the city of Rome. And the emperor at that time, Nero, he responded to that fire by starting and beginning a widespread persecution of Christians throughout the empire, starting from Rome and then radiating out throughout the empire. And what, here's what Nero did. He blamed the Christians for the fire. Now, it wasn't so much that he said the Christians set the fire. It's actually been documented that the fire was set by, by other things, not by the Christians. But that didn't stop him. Here's why. Because Nero said, the reason this fire happened is because the gods are angry at us, right? The pagan, Roman, Greek gods, they're angry at us. And why are they angry? Because so many people in our country, in our empire, are becoming Christians. Isn't that incredible? So all these people in the empire were becoming Christians. It was sending shockwaves throughout the empire. And Nero said, the gods must be angry at us because all these people are leaving the pagan religions and turning to Christianity. So therefore, here's what we must do to appease the gods. We need to eradicate Christianity. So what they started doing is they started going around, rounding up Christians throughout the empire, going and finding their gatherings. Now what this did, it forced a lot of Christians underground, a lot of Christian gatherings had to go underground. Maybe you've heard about the catacombs in Rome, right? Christians going underground, literally, to have their worship services so that they could do it in secret. And you can go visit it even to this day. You can see Christian symbols etched into the walls in the catacombs under Rome. But what happened is that the Romans, whenever they would find Christians or or break up a gathering, what they would do is they would take those Christians, they'd give them the opportunity to recant and to deny Jesus. And if they were unwilling to do that, well, then they would kill them. And, and they did it in a various ways, right? We know of stories from this time in which they would take them all out to lakes, even cold, frozen mountain lakes, and they would just drown people in mass. We know of stories like, for example, the Apostle Paul. He was captured and he was beheaded. His head was cut off. Again, in the same time, 64 AD. We also know that um, many of them were burned at the stake. Other Christians were taken into the Colosseum where crowds watched as, you know, hungry wild animals were set free to rip them apart and eat them right there in front of the crowds. And Nero would often take the bodies of the these dead Christians, and he would cover them in oil, and then he would set them up and use them as human torches to light his parties at night, where they would do chariot races at night, and the torches on the sides of the track were the bodies of Christians being burned. Just keep all that in mind. And here's what happens. Remember, Paul has been decapitated. Paul, the guy who used to write letters to all the churches in different places in the empire. And with Paul gone, leaving a huge void, Peter now says, 
all right, it's time for me to step up. He picks up a pen and he writes this letter, not just to certain Christian congregations in certain cities, but to all the Christians throughout the empire. And he wants to remind them in this letter. He says, guys, look, life is hard. It might not get easier, but here's the thing. You need to remember this world is not our home. We have a hope in heaven. We have a hope in Jesus Christ that nothing and no one can ever take away from us. Nero can't steal it from us. Sickness can't destroy it. Not even death can take it away from us. In fact, death, all it does is bring us closer to the fulfillment of that hope we have in Jesus. This hope we have, this promise, this treasure is secure in heaven. It is kept for us, and God is keeping you for it as well. It is secure. And so in the face of Nero, in the face of sickness and death and hard circumstances, you can be absolutely confident. You can look it right in the eye and not even flinch. You can be bulletproof because of this hope that we have. Jesus won it. It's done. He said it is finished. So no matter what happens to you in this life, sickness, hardship, disappointment, if your faith is in Jesus, this world is not your home. And the good news of the gospel is that when this life is over, your heavenly father is going to take his children home to that true home where there will be no more sickness, no more death, no more pain, no more prejudice, no more death forever. And because of this great hope that we have in Jesus, we who trust in him in this life, you know what we're like? We're like sojourners. We're like people who are just passing through. This world is not our home, and it's not our final station. This is not where our hope ultimately lies. Our hope lies in the world that is to come, in the promise that is to come, in our true home. And yet, as sojourners, we're not here for no reason. God has left us here with a mission. It's a mission to go fishing, right? It's a mission to be what he called fishers of men, right? To go out and draw people to him, help them know the truth and find salvation in Jesus so they can have that same hope that we have. So here's the deal. As sojourners, Peter says, as sojourners who are on a mission, we don't give in to the world and we also don't give up on the world. So we don't give into the world and we don't give up on the world. So Peter begins this section in which he's telling us how to live as sojourners who are on a mission in this world. And he uses this phrase right there at the beginning. He says, for the Lord's sake. Now just do me a favor, turn to the person next to you and say, for the Lord's sake, for the Lord's sake. Okay, now there, there, are, there are a couple phrases that we use in our language like that, right? We say, for the Lord's sake, turn down that music. We say, for God's sake, get in here, right? Like we say, for heaven's sake, you know, stop kicking your soccer ball in my yard or I'm not giving it back or whatever it is that people say, right? Right. So we use these kind of phrases. Why? When we want to show someone that we really mean business and we're not joking around, we want to get their attention. We, we want to motivate them to do something. And what we're doing is we're appealing to a higher power, aren't we? We're appealing to heaven, to God, to the Lord. We're saying, for the Lord's sake, do this. Don't do it for my sake. I'm appealing to a higher power to motivate you to do something. And that is what Peter's doing right here. So what is it that Peter is so passionate about that he wants us to do for the Lord's sake? Well, check it out. Verse 13. For the Lord's sake, be subject to every human institution, whether it be an emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him. What? Like that wasn't as exciting as what I was hoping for, right? Like he's like, for the Lord's sake. And then he's like, now obey the government. And I'm like, oh man, what was that? The emperor? You mean Nero, right? You mean, you mean the guy who cuts our heads off and has us burned in his yard? That guy? You want me to be subject to that guy? Peter, are you sure? Are you serious? And Peter would say, yeah, I'm serious. Didn't you hear what I just said? I said, for the Lord's sake, I was emphatic. Yes, do it. See, here's, here's the problem, right? That's the title of this first section, the problem. Here's the problem. We all love leadership when we're the one in charge don't we? we? We do. So if you go in into any bookstore, there is like a big sign hanging from the ceiling, leadership, right? There's like a whole section in the bookstore, the whole section on Amazon about leadership. If you go on Apple Podcasts, you are going to find thousands of leadership podcasts because we all love leadership. And these podcasts and these books, they all encourage you. Hey, no matter who you are, no matter what stage of life you're in, in some area of your life, you have leadership. So read our book, listen to our podcast, and we want to help you lead well. I love those books. I read those books. We all love those podcasts and those materials, right? 
Here's why. Because we all love to be the one who calls the shots and makes the decisions. There's even a whole genre of leadership. And I've read some of these leadership books and podcasts and stuff. There's this whole like, subgenre of leadership called leading up. Okay, leading up. Let me just put it in layman's terms for you. Leading up means how to manipulate your boss to get him to do what you want him to do so that even when you're not in charge, you can still control every situation. In other words, we love to be in control. We love to be the one calling the shots and manipulating things and making things go the way we want them to do. But what about when you're not the one in charge? What about when you're not the one in control? Like, where's the book on that? That doesn't get a big section in the bookstore, right? Like, good luck finding a book on that subject. Hey, here's how to follow when somebody else is in charge. Here's how to submit to a leader. Where's the podcast about how to be under authority? Right, there's so much material out there about that subject. Our culture is obsessed with leadership, and there's so much out there on this topic, but there's almost nothing about subjection and about how to be under authority. Conversely, though, you know what's so crazy? The Bible has a lot to say about it. And maybe that should kind of give us a check, right? Like, are we, are we balanced here? Because the Bible has a lot to say about being under authority and about how to follow well and about how to, how to do that. So, you see, here's what Peter knows. See, Peter knows something that's true in your life. Ultimately, in your life, you are going to face issues with authority, you're going to have situations where you're not the one in charge. And so the question is this, how do we shine brightly for Jesus when we're not the one in charge, when somebody else is calling the shots? How should you relate to people who are over you in positions of authority or power? How do you do that as a faithful Christian, as somebody who's living unto the Lord, right, for the Lord's sake? Because here's the other thing. At some point in your life, whether it's happened yet or not, it will happen. You will be under the authority of a person who is a moron. You will, right? At some point in your life, you're going to be under the authority of somebody who, who's a moron. And, and you're going to look at them. They're going to be maybe your supervisor, maybe your employer. And you're going to look and be like, you know, they shouldn't even allow you to use metal silverware, right? Like you're incompetent and you, you don't make good decisions and you're horrible with people and you don't respect this person because they're unethical maybe or because they're just awful. And maybe it's a politician out there who you don't like and you didn't vote for him and you don't want to, you don't want them in office. So this is the problem, isn't it? This is the problem. It's an authority issue when you're not the one in charge. And we all face situations like that in our lives. So Peter tells us what our posture should be towards those in authority when it's not us. And that's our second point, a posture. Peter says there in verse 13 that our posture, whenever we are under someone else's leadership, should be one of submission and humility. Submission and humility. He says, be subject to, for the Lord's sake to every human institution. And that's not very popular, right? Like, but here's the thing. This word, be subject, in the original Greek text, right? This letter was written in Greek. In the original Greek text, it's the word hupatasso. Hupatasso, which means to arrange yourself under. To arrange yourself under. And it's actually a military word. It refers to someone who is of a higher rank. When you come in contact with someone who has a higher rank than you. And it means arranging yourself under that person who has a higher rank than you do. It's a military term. So in whatever situation you are in in life, if you're a student in school, if you have a job and you're at work, or, or maybe, you know, there are police in our town, if they, there's, there are speed limit signs as you drive down the road, there's a tax authority. See, any area where there is an authority, large or small, he's saying submit yourself to it. Submit yourself to it. Choose to stand down. Choose to defer. Imagine that you're a player on a team. Let's say like a football team, right? Or a basketball team. You're a player on a team and the, there's a coach who's calling the plays and the coach calls a play that you don't like. You wouldn't have chosen that play. You think it should be a different play. And with this idea of hupatasso, right, arranging yourself under, under someone else's rank, it's the attitude that says, I'm going to run this play with my whole heart, even if it's not the play that I would have chosen. Even if it's not the play I would have chosen, I'm going to run this play with my whole heart. Now, maybe you say, okay, 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 but what if it's a stupid rule that I don't agree with? What if, what if my boss 
I think he's, he's an idiot and my idea is better than his idea? Or what if I don't agree with or like this person in authority and I don't like what they're telling me to do? That is the perfect opportunity for hupatasso, to arrange yourself under. See, because what Peter's describing here, it's not a matter of who's right and who's wrong. Right? It's not a matter, he's not asking, well, is your boss right? Then, then do what he says. He, it's not a matter of who's right and who's wrong. See, here's the thing. You can be completely right about the issue in question and yet respond in a way that's completely wrong. And respond in a way that's completely wrong in the way you handle it. In fact, this posture of arranging yourself under a person who's in authority, it's especially important when that person is wrong. That's what he says in verse 18. He says, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle masters, but also to the unjust. So Peter's saying, hey, there are going to be times in your life when you are under the authority of somebody who is unjust. And, and those are really the times when your character is put to the test. See, it, it's easy to follow somebody who's a good leader, who's a good, gentle, good you know, helpful leader. But when somebody's not, that's when you're put to the test, right? That's when your character's put to the test. It's been said that everybody likes to be called a servant of God until they're treated like one, right? Everybody likes to say, hey, I'm a, I'm a servant of the Lord until they're treated like one. If you ever hear somebody, you know, going on and on talking about how much they have a servant's heart and how much they are a servant, just do this. Just ask them afterwards at some point to get you a cup of coffee, right? And then, then we'll find out, right? We'll find out how they react. So you always find out how much of a servant you are when someone treats you like a servant, right? And then we'll say, hey, don't treat me like a servant. Well, just five minutes ago, you said that you were a servant, right? Like, and most of us don't like it, do we? We don't like, like we like to have the idea that we have a servant's heart. We just don't actually like being treated like servants, but these are the instances when we are put to the test. It's easy to submit to a good leader, but it's challenging. It's a real test when you have to arrange yourself under somebody you don't agree with or somebody you don't like. And remember, just keep in mind, again, who was the authority figure that Peter and these guys were dealing with in their time? Nero, right? The guy who kills their friends and, and lies about them and all these things. And, and look at what Peter says in verse 17. He says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood. That's speaking of those in the church, the community of Christians. Fear God and honor the emperor. You mean the guy who burns Christians for his drunken parties at night? Yeah, that's the guy. Honor him. But he's not honorable, yeah, but he's in a position of authority, so show him respect even if he doesn't personally deserve it. See, here's why. Think about this. You can't spell authority without author. You can't spell authority without author. And the reason we do it, the reason we arrange ourselves under those who are in authority in different areas of life, remember what Peter said at the beginning, for the Lord's sake... We do it for the Lord's sake. We don't do it for Nero's sake. We don't do it for our boss's sake. We do it for the Lord's sake. We're living and doing that unto him to please him. See, see, we don't look at that person in authority and determine if they deserve our honor or respect. Rather, we honor and respect them because of the position they're in. Why? For God's sake. Here's why. Because we believe that there is a sovereign God who allowed that person to be in that position with authority over us at this particular time for a purpose, for a purpose. Now, that doesn't mean that God approves of everything they do. I mean, far be it. Definitely not. But here's the thing. It means that God has allowed them in his sovereignty, in his providence to be in that position. Paul explains this in Romans chapter 13, where he explains that there is no authority except from God, so we should honor those in positions of authority over us. And here's the thing that's really interesting. There are many instances in the Old Testament where we get kind of the bird's eye view. We get the 2020 view, seeing things, you know, after they've already happened. We get the whole picture of what God was doing, even though the people who lived in it didn't exactly see what God was doing at the time. And so here's what happens, that there are times when God raised up a bad leader, a bad leader, even in maybe a selfish leader or even an evil leader, to come over and rule over the people of Israel in order to accomplish something amongst them. And many times it's very clear that God allowed that person or that ruler to come into that position of power because he wanted to use them 
and, and their bad leadership. He wanted to use their bad leadership to accomplish something good in his people's hearts and their lives. For example, in the prophet Habakkuk, the prophet Habakkuk. It's a very interesting book because the people of Judah at the time that God spoke to Habakkuk the prophet, the people of Judah and Jerusalem, they were turning away from God. They were doing evil things. And so God told Habakkuk, he said, look, the people are not listening when I talk. They're not returning to me. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans who are the Babylonians, right? So he's like, I'm going to raise up the Babylonians and the Babylonians are going to conquer Judea and Jerusalem, and they're going to rule over them for a period of time. God said he's raising them up, right? He's doing it. He's raising them up for the purpose of conquering Israel and ruling over Israel. Why? So that through the process of being conquered and being ruled by these evil leaders, the people would, through that process, repent of their wicked ways and turn back to God. And here's the thing. If the people of Jer Jerusalem and Judea were wicked at this time, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, were 10 times more wicked. They were more wicked. Can you imagine this? The, the, the Babylonians were 10 times worse. They were way more wicked. They were way more godless. And so how can it be that God would appoint a wicked and godless ruler to conquer and rule over his people? And the prophet Habakkuk actually asked that question. That's what's so interesting about his book. He asks, God, how is this fair? If you're judging Judea and Jerusalem for being wicked, how can you raise up an even more wicked nation to rule over them? How is that right? And God told Habakkuk, he said, hey, just chill out a little bit. Don't worry, because I am going to deal with the Babylonians and their wickedness in due time. But in the short term, for the moment, I'm going to use them, even though they're wicked, to put them in authority over my people in order to accomplish something in my people. And in retrospect, we can see that that truly did happen. For the people of Judah and Jerusalem, being conquered by the Babylonians, it wasn't fun, right? The Babylonians were cruel, they were harsh, the exile was painful, and it was hard. But it was also the best thing that ever happened to them. Can you imagine? It was the best thing that ever happened to them. During the exile, the people did, in fact, turn back to God. During the Babylonian exile, the people were cut off from the temple in Jerusalem. And so what they started doing was they started gathering in what we now call synagogues. They would gather weekly to study the scriptures and to pray. Throughout Israel's history, they didn't have a strong, consistent culture of reading the scriptures and praying. But now they did because of the exile. Do you understand? Like, and, and as they studied the word, what did it do? It prepared them for the coming of the Messiah as they got to read the Bible and see, hey, this is, who the, this is what God said about the Messiah. It prepared their hearts for Jesus. So many good things. The people went into exile divided. They came out united, and they were stronger spiritually. So God used wicked, godless rulers to accomplish something good in their lives because he loved them and was committed to them. And the same thing, I believe, is true in our lives as well. Can God use a bad leader to accomplish good things in our heart? Absolutely. The question is this, what will your posture be towards the authorities that God puts in your life? What will your posture be? Will you submit yourself to them? Will you do hupatasso, right? Will you align yourself under them and run that play with all your heart, even if it's not the play that you would have chosen? Will you do it for God's sake, knowing that you can't spell authority without author and trusting that God must have put that person in authority over you for this time, for a purpose, to accomplish something, whatever that might be? Maybe you would say, okay, okay, but what if, we always go to the what ifs, right? What if there's a Holocaust, right, and the the government wants to kill the Jews and I've got to, you know, put them in my closet to save their lives? Well, yeah, obviously, there are some exceptions to these rules. In fact, we see several exceptions throughout the Bible. One interesting instance is when Peter himself did that, right? In Acts chapter 4, the authorities there in Jerusalem said, hey, you guys have to stop preaching about Jesus. Knock it off. And Peter told them with all respect, he said, look, 
I'm sorry, but we can't do that. Jesus told us to go into the whole world and preach this gospel to every creature. So I'm sorry, if it were anything else, we would definitely say yes. But on this one, you're making us choose between obeying Jesus and obeying you, and we gotta go with Jesus on this one. But we do it respectfully, right? Well, so what the Bible say, when it talks about this issue of submission, it's never absolute. Keep that in mind. It's never absolute. If somebody in a position of authority tells you to do something that is wrong, that is harmful, that is unethical, that is sinful, by all means, you should not do that thing, right? You might even need to go to a higher authority to turn that person in if, it, if it's of that magnitude, right? We obviously obey God and not man when we have to decide between the two. But here's the thing. Most of your life is not going to be spent in that area. It's not going to be spent in the area of exceptions. It's going to be spent in the area of this rule of aligning yourself under, right? Most of your life is not going to be spent in the situations. I was trying to think this week. I can only think of a handful, maybe two or three instances in my entire life when I've been told by a person in a position of authority to do something that was wrong, and I had to say, no, I, I'm not going to do that. Now, maybe for you it's more, but the truth is that most of our lives are not going to be spent this way, right? Like if your boss is asking you to lie or to do something immoral, then you should say no. But if your boss wants you to do something that you just don't feel like doing, well, then you should, you should do it. That's a different story. See, our tendency is to immediately jump to like the most extreme circumstance. Oh, well, what if there's a Holocaust and I have to hide the Jews, right? Uh, so here's the deal. Look, if there's a Holocaust and you have to hide the Jews in your closet to save their lives from the government, you should totally do that. But tomorrow at work, right? Like tomorrow at work when your boss asks you to fill out that spreadsheet and you think it's a dumb idea, hupatasso, align yourself under them, right? The majority of our lives are spent in the rule, not in the exceptions. So align yourself under, submit for the Lord's sake. And this posture comes with some promises. Here are the promises. What will happen if you live this way? I've got three that I see in the text, three promises. If you live this way, number one, you will be rewarded by God. Number two, you will silence the critics. And number three, you will experience greater freedom. So you'll be rewarded by God, you'll silence the critics, and you'll experience greater freedom. Let's talk about that first one, being rewarded by God. In verse 19, Peter says, this kind of attitude of submitting to those God has put in authority over you, even if they're bad leaders, he said, this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures suffering while suffering unjustly. He says, what credit is it to you if when you sin, you are beaten for, uh, for it and you endure, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, that's a gracious thing in the eyes of God. Here's what he's saying. Uh, it's interesting. He uses this word gracious and another word credit. Gracious and credit. Did you know those are actually the same word? In the Greek text, they're the same word. It's the word kara, which from which we get our word grace. It means gift. It's a credit, but it also can mean a reward. And so what he's saying is this. If you submit to God, right, if you submit to the authorities in your life out of reverence for God, God will see it and he will reward you for it. Again, he's speaking to people who were being treated unjustly and unfairly. They were being abused even in some cases, and he encourages them Look, if you can't do anything about this, then you suffer. Make sure that you are suffering for doing the right thing, not suffering for doing the wrong thing. And if you do that, God will deal with those people who treated you unjustly, and he will deal with you by rewarding you for your actions. Secondly, if you live this way, you will silence the critics. Guys, you know this. There will always be critics, right? There will always be people who, when you decide to follow Jesus, they'll be looking for something to criticize. And Peter says in verse 15, he says, for this is the will of God. We should all listen up, right? When he says this is the will of God, that's what we all wonder all the time. What is the will of God? Well, Peter's going to tell us this is the will of God, that by doing good, you would put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. In other words, don't give the critics anything to criticize. If you're the Christian guy or the Christian girl in your school or in your work, live so beautifully as such a good employee or a contractor that it silences the critics to the point where what they say about you is this, I'm not sure if I believe what you believe, but maybe there's something to it because I can see the way you live. And if, if what you believe causes you to live that way, then maybe there's something to it that I need to reconsider. 
And the third point here is this. If you live this way, you'll experience greater freedom. So remember back at the beginning, I told you about my friend. My friend uh, who said, I could never be a Christian because I like being free. I don't want to be under the control of anything. I want to do whatever I want. Here's what my friend is failing to see. Everybody is controlled by something. He is controlled by something, right? His commitment to not having responsibility is a commitment, right? In other words, he is controlled by that. If you, all of us are submitting to something and anything you are controlled by limits your freedom. So anything that you live for limits your freedom. For example, if freedom means the ability to do whatever you want to do, well, having a job gives you a degree of freedom, doesn't it? Because you have money, which allows you, enables you to do the things you want to do. I like snowboarding, but snowboarding costs money. So my job gives me the freedom to do what I want to do, which in this case is snowboarding. On the other hand, while having a job gives you freedom in some ways, it also limits your freedom in other ways, right? Like you have to be there for 40 hours a week. So you have to decide which limitation gives me the freedoms that I want. Which limitation gives me the most freedom, the best freedom, the, the right kinds of freedom. Having a car gives you a lot of freedom, but if you use your freedom to drive that car into a lake, then you lose the freedom that having the car gave you in the first place. So you might say, so are you telling me that I'm not free to drive my car into a lake? No, you are free to drive your car into a lake, but if you do that, your, free, your use of your freedom will limit your further freedom in the, in the future, right? Like, you, you will have more freedom if you drive your car on the road than if you drive it into lakes. So someone famously said this, when you fall in love, you give up your freedom in order to get something better. Let me say this again. When you fall in love, you give up your freedom in order to get something better. Think about it. In order to experience the joys of marriage, you have to give up a lot of freedom. Guys, I had a lot of freedom uh, when I was not married. I go wherever I want to, do whatever I want. Now I come home, my wife wants to know who I was with, where I was at, how much money I spent, and, and I'm bound, aren't I? I'm not free anymore right? That's not freedom. But if I submit myself to those limitations, I get a different kind of freedom. I get the ability to do something else, which I would argue is better, this incredible intimate relationship. Again, if freedom is the ability to do whatever you want, in order to do anything, you have to do it at the exclusion of something else. One writer calls it this. He calls it these are um, liberating constraints. They are liberating constraints. In every area of your lives, we have liberating constraints. And so the question is, which freedoms do you want most? Which freedoms are most important? Which freedoms lead to the greatest amount of joy? See, everybody's controlled by something. If you're committed to not having any responsibility, that controls you, that limits what you will do and what you can do, right? It, it limits you from experiencing other freedoms. So there are certain freedoms that we have as Christians. We are free from fear. We're free from fear because our future is certain. God holds our presence present in his hand. We're free from judgment for our sins because Jesus took it for us. We're free from the power of sin and the bondage of sin. We're free to say yes to God and no to the things that entrap us and tear us down. So in order to receive these freedoms that are offered to us in Jesus, we have to do what? We have to hupatasso, to bring ourselves, arrange ourselves under God, making him our Lord, humbling ourselves and repenting of our sins, clinging to Jesus. When you make him your Lord, you submit your life to him, and that's when you get the right kinds of freedom that lead to the maximum joy. What we don't want to do, Peter tells us in verse 16, we don't want to use our freedom in a way that leads us back into bondage. Think about Adam and Eve. Isn't that what they did? They used their freedom in a way that led them back into bondage and pain and death. You know, for some people when they hear, hey, we have freedom in Christ, they're like, great, cool, now I can watch porn and smoke pot, right? And that, he's saying, no, you can use your freedom in a way that leads you back into bondage and don't do that. He says, live as free people, but don't use your freedom as a cover up for evil, rather live as a servant of God. So which is it? Are we free or are we servants of God? And the answer is this, the only way to be truly free, to be free in all the best ways, in the most ways, the most joy is to live as a servant of God. 
So that's why the apostles would refer to themselves as bond servants. It's in like five of the letters. Peter does it, you know, um, other, Paul does it, James does it, bond servant. What, what was a bond servant? It's a person who had been granted their freedom and they use their freedom to say, you know what? The best life for me is serving my master in my master's house because he's a good master and I don't want to use my freedom to leave him. I want to use my freedom to serve him. And he said, that is what it means to be a Christian. And we'll finish with this, the pattern. The pattern, this is our last thing. Peter says in verse 21, he says, this is how we should relate to authority. He says, to this you've been called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example so you might follow in his footsteps. Jesus set us a pattern to follow. And check it out, verse 22. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. He continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus entrusted his life to him who judges justly. That's God. What does it look like to do that in your life? To entrust yourself to him who judges justly. If freedom means being able to do whatever you want to do, think about what that means. Think about what it meant for Jesus. What was the thing that Jesus wanted to do more than anything else? The answer is clear. What Jesus wanted to do, what he did with his freedom was he rescued you. He redeemed you so that you could know him and you could spend eternity with him. And in order to do that, he submitted himself to the Father for a time, suffered for a time so that he could have the joy of setting you free from sin, from death, from fear, from destruction. And he set a pattern for us to follow. The true freedom, ultimate joy comes from hupatasso aligning yourself under your heavenly father and entrusting your life wholly to him. He says in verse 24, he bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Jesus didn't only die for our sins to forgive our sins, but also set us free from the power of sin and the consequence of sin. So now we are free, he says there, to live to righteousness, a whole new way of living. And finally, he says this, you were straying like sheep. Now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. How do you live as a free person? Here's how, by submitting to the right master, by submitting to the right master. Everybody's mastered by something. Everybody's life is controlled by something they want, something they're committed to, something they're pursuing. And the only way to be truly free is to be mastered by the only one who has done everything to provide you with freedom and joy that lasts. So I encourage you today, entrust your life to him, entrust your situations to him that you're going through and follow him wholeheartedly. Amen? Please stand with me and let's pray. Lord, thank you for this abounding joy that we have as we submit our lives to you. Thank you, Lord, that this is how we experience true freedom. Thank you, Lord, that you've set us free from fear, from death. Lord, you've set us free from the bondage. And Lord, we, we pray that you would help us to use the freedom we've received, not to put ourselves back again under a yoke of bondage, but to live as free people who serve you with our freedom as bond servants. Lord, help us to live that out in this coming week. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen.